Hello, I'm Tom Hartman in Washington, D.C., and here's what's coming up tonight. So it's been five years since the Fukushima nuclear disaster. How much have we learned and how well prepared are we for the next meltdown? That and more in tonight's Conversations with Great Minds with veteran anti-nuclear activists Paul Gunter and Kevin Camps. For tonight's Conversations with Great Minds, we're going to take a closer look at one of the largest nuclear disasters in history. Five years ago today, a massive magnitude 9.0 earthquake struck off the coast of Japan. That quake and the monstrous tsunami that followed killed almost 16,000 people and caused billions of dollars worth of damage. It also led directly one day later to one of the worst nuclear accidents in history when the now crippled Fukushima Daiichi power plant melted down. Five years later, cleanup from that meltdown is ongoing and questions about the feasibility and safety of nuclear power remain as pressing as ever. Joining me now to help answer some of these questions about this issue are Paul Gunter, director of the Reactor Oversight Project at Beyond Nuclear, and Kevin Camps, radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear. Thanks, gentlemen, for being here. It's great Thanks to have you both Thank with you, us. Um, before we get into Fukushima and nuclear power in general uh, around the world and in the United States, I'm curious, each of your stories, what, what brought each of you to anti-nuclear activism? Paul, can we start with you? Well, um, it was uh, in uh, 1975 that I first learned of a large reactor project that was going to go on um, in New Hampshire, uh, on the New Hampshire seacoast. Seabrook? It, in a saltwater estuary. Westinghouse wanted to build two 1150 megawatt reactors uh, in a, a very environmentally sensitive area. But, you know, again, this is 1975, and a lot of what I was feeling and the, the, the organizations that were starting to come together was really at a gut level. You know, there had been, you know, right then, you know, nuclear power was too cheap to meter. Um, there was, that's how it was being sold. Anyway. It was, it, it was, it was basically being uh, a propaganda tool to um, push this uh, inherently dangerous, exorbitantly expensive uh, industry that didn't have a, a waste uh, management plan. And <clears throat> so at the same time, the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission was holding licensing hearings. And we saw from day one that there were more lawyers, that the industry was marshalling, um, and the ratepayers were captured to pay, foot the bill for these lawyers. And, you know, we basically were funding our interveners through bake sales. Mm. So we needed something more than just uh, a legal intervention. Uh, we wanted a political action, and uh, a lot of us had training in the anti-war movement, civil rights movement, and we began um, a, uh, a, a protest. Uh, it was uh, the process of getting people out in the streets, and um, it followed uh, through that we learned uh, and exercised a civil disobedience campaign. Uh, training through nonviolence and uh, political action that uh, originally 18 of us got arrested on August 1st, 1976. Mm -hmm. So we're coming up on a, a big anniversary this year. Uh -huh. um, and uh, that set off uh, essentially what turned into the anti-nuclear movement here in the United States. And uh, eventually more than 4,000 people were arrested at the Seabrook construction site. We at one point had a, uh, an organiz organized uh, on-site occupation um, of by affinity groups of uh, 12 to 15 people of um, 2,000 people at one, one action. And um, it was uh, part of a movement that also brought together the whole idea of uh, consensus making decision uh, process and uh, uh, you know we recognized that it was important to treat people equally and uh, so um, the uh, the process brought forward uh, you know women's affinity groups uh, uh, lesbian affinity groups uh, all you know just a variety of uh, people brought together under a common agenda um, 
with, with by their common cause. Right. And um, that was in, That's in, remarkable. That was the, the That's beginning the, of the anti-nuclear movement here and, in the United States. And that was a, an enormous time, an extraordinary time of movement uh, change. Uh, Kevin? Well, start. the Clamshell Alliance is a huge inspiration. Paul's one of the founders. Um, for me, I was lucky enough in 1992 to be a part of a walk across America from Mother Earth, mm. which was a Belgian and Western Shoshone Indian organized event. And I missed the first three months they started in New York City, but I joined in central Indiana where I was going to college. And the full walk, some of my friends on the walk walked every step of the way. It was a 3,500 mile walk, nine and a half months. And it was focused on nuclear weapons issues, shutting down the Nevada test site where nuclear weapons were exploded for decades on end. And so right after I got home to Kalamazoo, Michigan, after that walk across the country that you know blew me away and opened my mind, right when I got home, headlines in the local Kalamazoo Gazette newspaper were about how the local atomic reactor called Palisades had run out of room in its indoor storage pool for high-level radioactive waste. And we're going to start plunking the waste out on the beach of Lake Michigan in concrete and steel silos called dry casks. And so I got involved at that point, and I've been working on nuclear power uh, ever since 1993. Wow. The Palisades, that was the one up near Charlotte? That's Big Rock was, Point. Oh, that was Big Rock uh, If you go right. um, west of Kalamazoo, that's the Palisades. They were the same company called Consumers Power back yep. then. Yep. Now Entergy Nuclear out of New Orleans operates Palisades, and they own the dismantled Big Rock Point site. But what's still up at Big Rock Point are eight of these silos of high-level radioactive waste in an it's open field. Still there in Charlotte? It has nowhere to go, but they're exploiting that situation. They're calling it stranded waste or orphaned waste, and they yep. want to take it mostly by train out west to Native American reservations or Department of Energy sites or other nuclear power plant sites and park it there. When I, when I was a little kid, my mother grew up in Charlevoix, and we used to go down to Lake Michigan on the beach, and my younger brother and I, and this is when I was like five, six, seven years old, but I remember vividly, there was this little stream of warm water that came from this, these giant buildings, and we used to sit and play in it because it Lake Michigan's really cold, and this water was really warm. And looking back on that, I'm going, that was from the nuclear power plant. And what the hell was warm water? You know, I mean, it was just uh, running across the surface. I mean, it had to have been a leak of some kind. Well, um, Big Rock Point was really an experimental reactor. It was tiny compared to most reactors. It was 70 megawatts electric. Yeah. The modern ones are 15 times bigger than that. Yeah. They were experimenting with nuclear fuels like plutonium mixed oxide fuel. Whoa. They broke fuel rods in the core. They had massive releases from these incidents. And even though the place is dismantled and supposedly cleaned up, they spent $366 million on the cleanup and they left plutonium in the soil, in the groundwater, and especially the Lake Michigan sediments. They've never even bothered to check to see how bad the contamination is out there. And they were discharging, as you hinted at, radioactivity into Lake Michigan for 35 years of operations. Wow. But they've never checked the contamination. I'm levels. lucky I don't glow in the dark. I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing. Um, it's been five years since Fukushima. What is the situation right now at Fukushima? Uh, Kevin? Well, we were just talking about discharges of radioactivity into water, so I'll touch on that issue. Ever since this thing began five years ago now, they have been hemorrhaging radioactive uh, liquid waste into the ocean. And so on a good day at Fukushima Daiichi, so to speak, you have 300 tons, which is 300,000 liters, which is about you know 80,000 gallons of radioactive groundwater flowing into the Pacific Ocean. That's on a good day. On bad days, they have things happen, like in the summer of 2013, when they lost an entire container of highly radioactive water. It leaked onto the ground, into the groundwater, and out into the ocean. And that was highly radioactive. That was not dilute, radioactively contaminated groundwater. So they have this massive problem of radioactive wastewater, and it's grown to epic proportions now. We're talking about over a thousand of these giant water storage tanks that are 30 feet tall. They're 10, 10 feet across at least, if not bigger than that. And they contain approaching a million gallons of highly radioactive, uh, I'm sorry, a million tons. It's 750,000 tons of uh, radioactive, highly radioactive water that they don't know what to do with. So that is a huge shoe that could still drop at Fukushima Daiichi. If, if they have another earthquake, if they have another tsunami, that farm of a 1,000 giant takes, tanks of uh, 
100 million gallons approaching. I'm sorry, these figures are so big. These numbers yeah. are so big. It's um, 750,000 tons. That's how much water, highly radioactive water, is in this tank farm. You could have a massive release if these hastily built tanks were to release their contents. It would sort of be like a reverse radioactive tsunami from the reactor site back into the Pacific Ocean. Well, and, and Paul, hasn't that been going on in slow motion for five years? Uh, the idea is um, that they don't, you can't trust what Tokyo Electric Power Company is giving us for figures. We really don't know. What, what's a big concern is that these three reactor cores have melted and they have uh, burned through the bottom of the reactor pressure vessels um, and they're, they've disappeared. Uh, the, the, the radiation is so intense that workers cannot get in there uh, to inspect, uh, to find these, this radioactive, these radioactive cores. Uh, even robots, uh, they, they've been sending robot after robot into the uh, reactors to try to identify where the molten reactor fuel is. And the, again, the radiation fields are so intense that it fries the electrical circuitry on these robots. Um, we suspect that the radioactive, uh, these molten cores, uh, which Tokyo Electric Power Company is 24-7 for the last five years pouring ra more water into these hulks, uh, these uh, exploded buildings to try to cool, keep these, rea these, these reactors cool and to keep the um, reactor fuel uh, immobile so it doesn't go deeper but we suspect that it's it's left the um, the containment and and in the ground is there a uh, we, we have about a minute before the break here is there a China syndrome scenario Paul where if this if this stuff is melting through basically rock and it hits groundwater that we get a geyser? Well, that, you know, this is the, uh, the essential cooling that's going on, that's been going on since... Uh, is to prevent that? Is to prevent that exact scenario. But still, uh, the, the, the fuel has disappeared. The, this molten mass uh, it has uh, not been found, but we do know that it's, it's down there, and um, efforts to try to uh, locate it and uh, to assure that it doesn't go... Uh, critical again, that's, that's the problem. Yeah, it's a, a, a very serious problem. Um, wow, is there, we have about a half a minute before the break, is, is, is there any, do they have any plan? It, right now, it's uh, they pave the road as they travel along this disaster. So it, this is, they're making it up as they go they along. They make it all up as they go. Jeez, that's amazing. More of uh, tonight's Conversations with Great Minds with Paul Gunter and Kevin Camp right after this. And welcome back to Conversations with Great Minds. Still with me for tonight's discussion about the five-year anniversary of the Fukushima disaster are Paul Gunter and Kevin Camps. Um, the ecology, the, 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 you know, uh, Fukushima was a densely populated area, in, or there were a lot of towns around there. There was also a lot of forest around there. Um, what has happened in that region as a result of this meltdown? We've been talking basically about the reactors and the ocean, but on the other side of the reactors is not ocean. What is it? Yeah, I had the opportunity, the privilege, to go to Fukushima Daiichi seven months before the catastrophe began. I was on a speaking tour of Japan, and hmm. the first stop after Tokyo was Fukushima Daiichi. Oh, that's ironic. So. Um, I was standing on a bluff overlooking the Pacific uh, to the east, and to my left, about three and a half miles or so, was Fukushima Daiichi, six reactors. To the south, to my right, another three and a half miles was Fukushima Daini, uh, four reactors. And it turns out that there were more reactors operating at Daini on 3.11.11 than there were at Daiichi. There were only three of the six operating at Daiichi that day, thankfully. They all melted down. And the four at Daini, the only reason they didn't melt down was a single off-site power line survived the earthquake because the tsunami was bigger at Daini. Wow. And the reason I describe all this, so it could have been twice as bad as it was, yeah. or even worse, if the pools had gone up in flames, then it would have been orders of magnitude worse yeah. than it was, and they almost did. So the reason I told you all that is because to my back were these amazing mountains. And so what you've got, a large chunk of Fukushima prefecture is forested mountains. Mm. 
And our board member, Kendra Ulrich, who's a senior nuclear campaigner with Greenpeace Japan, just put out a report about a week ago about the ecological impacts of Fukushima Daiichi. And they are uh, great. They are bad. And uh, what she described was mutations in plants, whether they're trees or mushrooms that are absorbing radioactivity at high concentrations. That used to be a staple of that area. That was a big shiitake mushroom uh, region. No more. It's poison now, just like at Chernobyl. And she also described uh, insects that have genetic mutations and will now pass those on to future generations of their species, butterflies and worms. And uh, you've also got other megafauna running around. You've got monkeys. And I just happened to hear a radio report today about, um, actually it was Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates who was traveling in this area recently and was with another scientist and they saw a monkey who uh, had a poop and they collected the poop and they analyzed it and it had 50,000 becquerels of cesium per kilogram in the poop. And so the point was Put that... Put that in context. What is it? What is well, 50, a becquerel, becquerel is a radioactive disintegration per second. And so in this monkey's poop, there were 50,000 radioactive disintegrations coming off of cesium contamination per kilogram. What's, what's the acceptable limit in the United States for for? Well, um, in food, and people aren't going to be eating monkey poop <laughs> unless it's a But the monkey ate something, coffee. and that's how it ended up. Well, um, in the United States, it's worse than Japan. In Japan, you can have 500 kilograms of radioactivity in a kilogram of food. 500, 500 becquerels in a, in a per kilogram. kilogram. Okay. In the United States, it's uh, 1,200. Okay, but, so, this, but this monkey was at 50,000. Yep, and so the monkeys are eating contaminated fruit and then pooping in. They're moving the radioactivity around. Another, another point in Kendra's report was that every time there is a storm, a typhoon, and Fukushima Daiichi has been hit by typhoons again and again, there's a spreading of the radioactivity from those forested mountainsides into previously uncontaminated places or into supposedly decontaminated places. And one of the amazing things going on in Fukushima Prefecture are these mountains of giant plastic bags that contain a ton of soil, leaves, sticks, contaminated surface radioactivity that are being put into plastic bags. They're essentially trying to clean the surface of the earth over a broad region into plastic bags and then what to do with those plastic bags. Well, the current plan is to turn the host towns of Fukushima Daiichi, two towns, Okuma and Futaba, into temporary radioactive waste dumps and put these mountains of plastic bags there that will then leave in 30 years. Well, that's dubious that they'll leave. And then there's also that practice that's been going on since the beginning of the incineration of radioactive debris which then puts radioactivity into the air right, to blow down wind and contaminate material these are elements yeah. these are not these are not molecules they're atoms they don't they don't break down when you heat them they just they just go into the air and they're going to you know push back and say well there'd be some filtration that's also dubious i mean certain radioactive poisons like tritium for example can't be filtered right. and that's a big part of the contamination in that highly radioactive wastewater we talked about the Japanese government is claiming that they have new technology. They're going to try to get the tritium out. It's going to be hugely energy intensive to do that, to put it mildly. One of the dangers is they may try to dump the tritium into the ocean and just say dilution is the solution to radioactive pollution. They've got American advisors, people like Lake Barrett, who used to run the Yucca Mountain Dump Program for the Department of Energy. He's over there getting paid by Tokyo Electric to say dump it in the ocean. You've got uh, a former NRC chairman from the United States named Dale Klein who's over there working for Tokyo Electric saying dump it in the ocean. Well, the currents come to the United States then, don't they? And, and the radioactivity has been reaching the North American West Coast uh, for some time now. Yeah. So, you know, Tom, I think what people should know is that 32 million Japanese have been affected by Fukushima's radioactive fallout. Mm. And we have an, uh, they have an area in Japan the size of Connecticut that now exceeds the, radi the uh, radiation protection standards established by the uh, international uh, group that looks, looks at radiation standards. Um, and <clears throat> so people are living in this radioactive soup. Um, and uh, I, I think it's important to know that this uh, radioactivity is still spreading. Uh, you know, what is really interesting is, is that we're seeing some of the first communities being affected by radiation 
are the are microbiological communities responsible for decaying uh, leaves and you know where those communities are now dying and being reduced the um, uh, the leaves falling out of these radioactive trees are not decaying as so they're the 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 because the, because the because bacteria, bacteria and the worms and things dead. are all dead they're from all the dead. radiation they're they're gone from the radiation so the the leaves are piling up in these forests and with every fire uh, it the, the radioactive cesium 137 and uh, strontium 90 and uh, one uh, you know all of these radioactive isotopes then go up in the smoke and then they blow wherever the wind is going and that, so we're seeing this um, in Fukushima but this this is the same signature that we see from Chernobyl now 30 years ago right, right. and and I've seen reports suggesting that there have been as many as 10,000 cases of at least thyroid cancer in in Japan that can be attributed to this. I don't. I, it's just a headline I remember from some time ago. Do we know what the actual has there has there been any attempt to measure the human impacts? Do we know how many cancers have been caused? Is it too early? Uh, what's what's the situation with regard to that? <clears throat> the um, if you look at the clinical evidence. Radiation causes cancer, causes mutations, uh, and uh, birth uh, deform children. Uh, so, what we you know the the clinical studies are show us that we should be anticipating this. It's still it's still early, but in fact, uh, thyroid cancers are uh, elevated, um, and we're uh, expecting uh, you know a lot of health effects. Um, but um, the, I think right now, at this stage of the accident, the fact is is that uh, because we know radiation causes these uh, maladies, that the populations have been dislocated. Uh, you know, more than 160,000 people were evacuated, but again, 32 million people are living in contamination, and. Um, the Abe government in Japan right now is looking to economically force uh, these uh, evacuated populations back into these contaminated areas where, you know, the limited cleanups, you know, they, they clean up a corridor, they clean up around a school, but in fact these are nothing more than open air prisons because as Kevin has pointed out, the, the, the background, the mountains, the uh, the forests, you cannot decontaminate this. And it all moves back in to these clean zones uh, eventually, uh, either by wind or water, but this is the circumstance. Is this, is this a, a scenario that we could see here in the United States, Paul? We have 30 of these General Electric Mark I, Mark II Fukushima-style reactors operating in the United States today. The, um, the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is our federal regulator, is pretty much in the same situation that Japan was in before the accident, in that they are more interested in protecting the financial interests of these nuclear power plant operators than they are uh, protecting public health and safety. We have seen uh, time and time again where um, for example, um, the Japanese diet, their parliament, they put out a study in 2012 that attributed Fukushima, uh, you know, recognizing the natural uh, calamity that caused it. They acknowledged that the real root cause was collusion of government, regulator, and utility to advance financial agendas over public health and safety. And we're seeing that here in the United States. It is a pattern that the Japanese actually learned from the United States. Oh, wow, wow. Um, uh, Kevin, the uh, nuclear power, the president uh, has been promoting nuclear power as a compromise solution or a bridge. We've got two nuclear power plants being built in the United States. Um, in the minute we have left here, uh, your thoughts on the wisdom of that. And is nuclear power actually carbon free? Well, um, nuclear power is a non-starter when it comes to the climate crisis. You have got astronomical costs. You have huge construction delays. We're seeing that in the United States and Georgia 
in South Carolina right now with these four proposed new reactors that are being built at public expense with subsidies. But beyond that, you've got insurmountable risks, as the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research has put it. You've got weapons proliferation. You've got accidents like Fukushima. And that figure of 10,000 cancers that you referred to, Physicians for Social Responsibility and International Physicians for Prevention Against Nuclear War uh, just put that out. 10,000 cancers can be expected from Fukushima. They've already seen 100 or more childhood thyroid um, cancers that you should have seen a handful at most. So that's Fukushima related. But besides that, the other insurmountable risks with nuclear power are the radioactive waste dilemma. It's deadly forever. We don't know what to do with it. And even routine releases of radiation at every stage of the nuclear fuel chain. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Um, Paul Gunter, Kevin Camps, thank you guys for being with us tonight. Thanks, Tom. To see this and other Conversations with Great Minds, go to our website at conversationswithgreatminds.com. And that's the way it is tonight, Friday, March 11th, 2016. And don't forget, democracy begins with you. Get out there, get active, tag, you're it.